In Algebra 2, we are going to be working primarily with real numbers. Now, as we work with the real numbers, we're going to be looking at different aspects and properties that they hold that allow us to perform certain algebraic functions. So the first thing we need to do is look at what types of numbers are out there. And to do this, we're going to look at this list that you see here. The first is our natural numbers. Now, natural numbers are those that you learn to count with as you're growing up. So 1, 2, 3, and so on. Now, as you were growing up and started working with these natural numbers, that was everything you had. Then, a new concept was uh, shared with you that added one new number to the system, and that was the number 0. So 0 plus the natural numbers make what are called the whole numbers. And with these two sets, you're able to do most things that you needed to for quite some time. Then, the concept came as you started interacting with friends, realizing that sometimes you had more than them, other times they had more of something than you. In which case, the idea of being without so negative 3, negative 2, 1, 5, of course still your 0 and other numbers that we've already discussed came in, and these were called the integers. Integers simply state are positive or negative numbers with a divisor of 0. Now the natural numbers and the whole numbers are part of integers. We are building a giant Venn diagram out of this, and each one is embedded inside of the next. So after we worked with integers, we started realizing that it was possible to do things part way. When we started dealing with money, it wasn't always $5 and $7, but we were able to do part of a dollar, in which case we started getting numbers like two-thirds, negative one-quarter, their decimal equivalents, uh, 0 0.3 for 3 tenths. And we were able to build all these ideas around numbers that could be written as a fraction. And some of these were repeating fractions, so 0 0.2727 continuing on. And this set of numbers were called the rationals. Now the rational numbers are stated as such simply because everything could be written as a ratio of two integer values. Now outside of this set is another set of numbers that cannot be written as a fraction. Numbers some of which you've been exposed to like pi, which is an infinite non-repeating decimal, the square root of 2, the fifth root of 83. Anything that cannot be simplified down into a ra ratio of two integers is considered irrational. And this set of numbers is not included in our portion of the remainder of everything we've spoken of. And all these together are encompassed inside of the group of the real numbers. Now there are numbers that we will study that are not real, but this is the basic set that we're going to work from. So as we have these real numbers, we have to think of what types of items that we talk about fall within each realm. So let's look at some examples. So choosing the right type of number. List all types of numbers that fit with the description given. You're on a team that is trying to raise money for the coming season. The money that you raise, what types of numbers could that entail? Could it be natural numbers? Yes. The natural numbers are normally symbolized by an N with a double crossbar. Could we use the whole numbers? Yes, we could. We could raise no money at all. The whole numbers do not have a special symbol. Could we have integers? Well, integers is not really a possibility because you're not going to raise a negative amount, 
However, we do have the natural numbers which are part of the integers, so we will include it. Now, the integers do have a special symbol. It is a Z with a double crossbar. Could we have the rational numbers? Could we raise $385.67? Yes, we could. So we're going to put the rationals in here. And the rational numbers also have a special symbol to, for them. It is the letter Q with a double upright in the middle. Could we have irrational numbers? Well, no, because every dollar amount that we raise has to be able to be expressed in terms of hundredths. So it's always going to be at least rational. Next, the distance from your home to all places that you go in a typical day. You could have natural number answers here. Couldn't really have the whole numbers because we're not adding zero. We could have the integers because we are including the naturals. And we could have the rational. But we can also have the irrational. Because we can go a distance that is, for instance, we could go pi miles to a friend's house but we would never be able to express that as a perfect ratio of two integers. The number of hot dogs that are sold by a vendor at a football game. Last one here. That's natural numbers. And we have the possibility of the whole numbers. And we would include the integers, although integers, the only thing that they add on outside of the natural is the value of uh, negative numbers and we're not going to have those. But we are limited to these. We can't sell half of a hot dog. Can't sell two-thirds of something. It's either we sell it or we don't. Now moving on with these numbers we have to be able to do certain properties with them. And those properties begin with identifying which numbers are larger and smaller. So here's a list of numbers, square root of 7, negative 2 thirds, the number 5, negative 1 sixth, and a positive 2 thirds that we want to be able to place in order from smallest to greatest. So to help with this we're going to start with a number line. So let's start our number line by placing the integer values on here. We'll put 0 about here and then count 2, 4, 6, negative 2. Of course, the ones that aren't counted are the odd numbers. We didn't skip anything. We just didn't want to put it all on there. So let's start with the easy numbers. 5 is relatively easy. That goes here. Call that one 5. Uh, 2 thirds will go about here. Negative two-thirds will go on the other side, about the same relative location. So that's negative two-thirds, positive two-thirds. A negative one and six-tenths is going to be just beyond a negative one and a half. So negative one and six-tenths. Now square root of seven. Square root of seven is a little bit different. We're looking for a number when multiplied by itself gives us seven, and no rational number will do that. But we do know that 2 squared is 4, and 3 squared is 9, so square root of 7 is going to be somewhere between 2 and 3, a little bit closer towards the 3 side. So we're going to make an estimate about here of the square root of 7. So placing these numbers in order, we come out with the final negative 1 and 6 tenths, negative 2 thirds, positive 2 thirds, square root of 7, and then 5. You should be able to do this with any set of numbers, rational, irrational, natural, even numbers are given in a percentage form. But once we have these numbers and have the relative idea of where they relate to each other on the number line, we do need to be able to perform certain operations with them. So the properties of math that we have in association with these real numbers are the ones listed here. Commutative property states that for addition 
and multiplication, the order of which we perform the operation does not matter. So if I say 2 plus 3, which is equal to 5, and 3 plus 2, which is equal to 5, these would be equal to each other. I commute it, or I change the order of these operations. Same thing is true for multiplication. 2 times 3 is equal to 3 times 2. However, subtraction and division, this does not work. So commutative property is a plus b is equal to b plus a, or a times b is equal to b times a. And it simply says the order can be changed for addition and multiplication. Next, the associative property. To associate with others is to be grouped with them. So when we are dealing with the associative property, again, this works for addition or multiplication, we are looking at how we group things in our simplification process. So the following hold true. Where 2 plus a quantity of 3 plus 4 is equal to the quantity of 2 plus 3 plus 4, we get 9 on either side. And then 2 times the group 3 times 4 is equal to the group 2 times 3 times 4, either of which is equal to 24. Now, in an algebraic sense, it would be written as a plus the group of b plus c is equal to the group of a plus b plus c, or a times the group of b times c is equal to a times b times c. And as we move through, most of these properties, again, are going to be addition or multiplication. Next comes the identity property. Now, the identity property says that we can add or multiply by a certain number and not change it. Now this also does hold true for subtraction and division. The identity allows our item to stay the same. So what can we add to a number and not change it? The answer is 1. Sorry, I mean the answer is 0. What can we multiply and not change it? That answer is 1. So the properties come out as 6 plus 0 equals 6. It retained its identity or 6 times 1 equals 6. Again, it retained its identity and holds the same value. Now, adding 0 and multiplying by 1 will come in a number of different forms, and we'll see that throughout the, our course of study. Now, algebraically, these are shown as a plus 0 equals a, and a times 1 equals a. Next up comes our inverse function, our inverse property. This is a way of undoing what we've had. And it says that 6 plus a negative 6 equals 0, or 6 times 1 6 equals 1. When we perform the inverse operations, or apply the inverse property, we end up with our identity elements. So algebraically, it states that a plus the opposite of a is 0, and a times the inverse of a, or 1 over a, equals 1. Distributive property applies to multiplication over addition or subtraction. So we are going to be handing out a value. So if we have 2 times the sum of 3 and 4, we can have 2 times 3 plus 2 times 4. And algebraically, this is written as a times the quantity of b plus c equals a times b plus a times c. And when we are doing this, we can also work with subtraction. And there are certain situations when we can work with division. We'll come across those through our course of study. The last item on here is closure. And the concept of closure talks back to our types of numbers. If you perform operations, do you stay within the same group? For instance, if we were to add two integers together, there's no way we could end up with an irrational number or a rational number that was not an integer. If we were to add two natural numbers together, we're not going to end up with a negative or zero. So these items are closed under their operations. However, if we were to subtract two natural numbers, it is possible, depending on the order, to end up in the negatives, in which case we now have moved out of natural numbers and are in the integers. So subtraction is not necessarily closed with the group of natural numbers. And we'll look at different situations with this for addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. 
through our course of study with Algebra 2. So make sure you understand these properties and the different types of numbers because they're going to be used extensively as we move through this year of study.